I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii, airing live every Tuesday at noon at thinktechhawaii.com. Today we're talking about the potential for a sustainable land transportation system on the island of Kauai. Back in 1991, I helped the county of Kauai and its private sector partners develop an overall economic development plan in which citizens envisioned the island as a model for sustainable transportation, amongst other things. 25 years later, then mayor and 20-year Kauai County Council member Joanne Yukimura is still striving to turn that vision into reality. While mayor, she started Kauai's public transportation system, the Kauai Bus, which has grown substantially over the last decade. Recently, as presenting chair of the council's Housing and Transportation Committee, she was instrumental in securing monies for the Kauai Multimodal Land Transportation Plan. The unstoppable graduate of Stanford University and the University of Washington Law School is here to tell us about this cutting edge plan. Welcome, Council Member Yukimura. Aloha, Kirsten, and we, aloha to your audience. We appreciate you coming from Kauai to keep us all informed of the latest and cutting edge initiatives on Kauai. And we know that this is such a hot topic for Hawaii in general as we try to meet our 100% uh, renewable energy goals. Tell us a little bit about this plan, and I think you've brought it with you. Well, let me just say that our transportation or our traffic problems are not as bad as Oahu, and we're trying, but we do have big problems. We're on a two-lane system, basically, which was built when our population was 30,000, and now it's 70,000. So there are major delays and major, um, there's major congestion, at least from our standpoint and our standard of a rural community. I uh, do remember when I lived on Kauai, uh, beginning in 1988, there was one traffic light. And yes. I thought that was one of the most attractive things about Kauai. There are many more and many more lanes to the highways now. Kauai is very different now than back then. And so we, we actually have a big problem. I, I would say the traffic congestion uh, is one of the biggest problems on the island. It's linked to the economy and whether we can operate with goods and services, um, and it very much affects people as they try to do their daily um, activities, such as going to work, going to the doctors, going to plays and And, and it's certainly activities. affecting tourism. I know that, very that much there's so. often commentaries on Yelp about the traffic on Kauai, right. as well as Oahu, of course. So the challenge for us is how do we solve our traffic problem? And when we look at Oahu, we don't think that just building bypasses and doubling uh, or adding lanes is going to get us to a place where traffic flows well. And, and so we, we do have a, a different approach. Um, it's, it's, I don't know that it's anywhere else in the state right now. And so we did a plan in 2013. The, um, the council adopted this Kauai Multimodal Land Transportation Plan, and it outlines in a very thorough way another approach. And that approach is to keep vehicle miles traveled flat or stable and not see it grow. And um, the next graph that we'll see shows what our goal is. You can see that um, it shows the millions of miles per year that are traveled in vehicles on the island, vehicle miles traveled. And if we go with a baseline scenario where a business as usual, it'll go from 771 million to 914 million miles over the next 20 years. If we do the preferred route, we will keep the number of miles traveled by vehicles uh, basically flat. And how we're going to do that is called mode shift. And that's the next chart coming up. Um, we're going to shift the mode of travel. You can see that in 2010, the single occupant vehicle, SOV, and the multiple occupant vehicle, um, or actually it's multiple occupant auto, took up more than 90% of the number of trips made on the island, whereas transit walking and bicycling were much, much less. If we implement our 
multimodal land transportation plan, by 2035, you will see a substantial drop in the single occupancy vehicle and multiple occupant auto. Even though it's still the same, we will double our walking, transit, and bicycling, actually almost triple um, those modes of travel. And by doing that, we think we can keep vehicle miles traveled less and therefore um, have much better flow and mobility on our island. So the multimodal transportation plan then must involve development plans as you move forward with any new residential units or tourism units, that this would involve incorporating in that a, a much more walking community, perhaps the complete streets model? Uh, complete streets is an integral part of this mode shift where we create streets that are not made just for cars, but also give fair access to and safe access to bicyclists, bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit. And we also have to, land use and transportation are inter, inextricably intertwined. And so it, we will also need to place our housing close to jobs and services. In fact, our plan says you cannot do it by mode shift alone. You have to also change the, um, our land use planning and, and not have these long commutes, but have people be able to walk or bike to work or short car or transit trips. So it's also part of the approach of transit-oriented development so that people's uh, trips are shortened as much as possible. And the only way to do that is with land planning and how is this then intertwined with the general plan development on Kauai? Well, we are right now updating our general plan, but basically it's about where we locate our housing and we want to locate it close to services. And so actually, um, we just finished our Lihue community plan and that is seen as the main area for growth of housing. Um, because we know that transportation costs really affect total housing costs. You might get a, a affordable house, but if it's far away from where you work, that cost has to be factored in and can really affect household income. And that doesn't even mention what you, what you discussed earlier, which is a drop in productivity as people have to commute longer. I know that that's the difficulty for people on the west side of Oahu right now is huge loss in productivity sitting in traffic. Or the families on the big island where, you know, the parent leaves before the ch children wake up to go to school and come back after the children are in bed. It's, it's not just about productivity, but it's about family time and quality of life. Um, you know, on Kauai, we don't have as long distances, but the long commutes and the traffic congestion do, I mean, not the long, the long or the time. Yes, yeah, the, <laughs> the, time. Commu the commutes being stuck in traffic um, do affect uh, our quality of life tremendously. And also, um, so in order to do that, we have to, oh, thank you, look at this chart. Um, that explains how much capacity of road you can free up when you shift the mode. That shows, I think, 60 cars um, with 60 people in each car, all the riders are, are gathered mm -hmm. in, in a cluster, but um, those people, in e one in each car in the middle photo, will take up a lot of road space, whereas if they were in a bus, that's 60 people outside of a bus, you can see how much road space you free up. And bicycles on the uh, right-hand side shows you also how shifting to the bike mode frees up road space. And that kind of conceptualizes the approach of the multimodal plan. And I would think that also gives a tremendous sense of relief in terms of oppressive density of space. You know, people will have a much greater sense of open space when you start moving Well, I would those call cars. it more open roads. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's what people are looking for. Right. That's what we need. Um, in order to do that, I want to say that we will have to grow the bus system actually by a thousand percent. Our plan shows that, and we can go to the um, transit growth chart, but it shows that we'll move from 1,641 trips weekly, those are our weekly fixed route transit ridership, 
in 2010, we will have to increase that by to 18,000 trips per week. And that's a major, major growth um, spurt that we have to do. But the good news is that we don't have to convince people to get into a bus. What we found is when uh, we increase services, such as when we, in 2011, 2011, we went uh, from, we extended bus service from six o'clock at night till 10 o'clock at night, and we created weekend service. The ridership skyrocketed because now people could actually do things on the bus. They could go to work and they could come home from work. Right. You know, things like that. And so um, it's not about creating demand for bus services, it's about providing services and the, the demands there, and people will ride if it's convenient and easy to use. It's interesting, one of the things we discovered when I was helping um, my partners work on the Whistler um, sustainability plan. In Whistler, that, Canada. In Whistler, Canada, and, and similarly a very tourist-oriented economy, was that if we provided a uh, bus service that was maximum 10-minute wait, mm -hmm. then people would ride it and use it all the time. If, you, if they had to wait 11 minutes or mm -hmm. 12 minutes, mm -hmm. they wouldn't take it. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, exactly what you're saying is that as long as you're meeting people's needs, mm -hmm. which is one of the major tenets of sustainability, that we're meeting everyone's needs equally, and that applies to sustainable transportation. Mm -hmm. So that means that with the Kuwait bus, you're not only going to have to add buses, but you're going to have more frequency of, Absolutely. of those stops and, and those routes. Frequency, as you just pointed out, is one of the keys. We also need shelters. Right now, people stand in the hot sun or rain, and the elderly don't have place to sit down in most of our um, sh uh, bus stops. But we're embarking on creating f uh, shelters at 50 bus stops. I know that's small here in Oahu, but for us, that's big. Um, and the indicators, I just saw that on the screen. Let's go to that now. Um, this plan, if followed, will um, be sustainable because if you look at the fourth um, line down, one, two, three, four, yeah, oh, third line down, annual gallons of motor fuel consumed. And um, compared to the 2010 level, which is the first column, the baseline, is the next column, shows that the fuel consumed, if we just do business as usual, be about 13%. And that's because of car efficiency and electric cars and that kind of thing. But if we do the mode shift and the implement the multimodal plan, we're going to reduce fuel consumption by 27%. Wow, more than double. Yes, and, and that's a goal I've heard nationally, you know, to reduce fuel consumption. And then if you go further down to annual greenhouse gas emissions, we will be, instead of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it's related to efficiency. Um, by 13%, we're going to reduce it also by 27%. That's why this is a sustainability plan, because it's going to actually impact those sustainability indicators. And that proves the point that we often make, which is efficiency first, before we need to have technical, you know, renewable energy applications and other things, we've got to start being more efficient and reduce our consumption. Yes. So, but as the so that's without any renewable energy technical applications mm -hmm. like more electric vehicles or more perhaps renewable sun food, uh, fuel. And re more renewable fuel. Well, but, and besides that, there are so many more um, uh, other indicators that are going to move. And if we can go back to that sheet, you will see that fatalities, it's fourth from the bottom, fatalities from motor vehicle collisions per 100 million BMT will, if we go with business as usual, we will have no drop in fatalities. But if we go with the preferred scenario under the multimodal plan, there'll be a 15% drop in fatalities. And you can see the weekday transit ridership just below that will move from 1,600 trips to a 1,000% increase to that 18,000 trips a week. And what I love is below that, percent of adults meeting minimum levels of physical activity. This is a health plan as well for a healthy, healthier community. And you can see that 
we were at 50% of adults having minimal levels of physical activity in 2010. If we go with the baseline business as usual, there'll be no increase. But if we go with the preferred plan, there'll be a 32% 32 32 increase. increase. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, let's sure. explore that a little bit more about healthy lifestyles as a result of good planning. All right. We'll be right back with Sustainable Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna. I hope you please visit us this summer. It's a wonderful summer. It's actually a cooler summer than we're used to. But I hope that you come back and visit us and watch our show, Education, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, here on Think Tech Hawaii. It's at noon every Wednesday. See you then. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha! This is Rez McJackal. The University of Hawaii football team under Rolovich is going to get wet this season. In case you didn't understand me, University of Hawaii football team is going to kick butt under Rolovich this season. So be sure to follow us on Think Tech Hawaii and Hibachi Top. I'll be at every game. And remember, aloha! Hi, we're back with Sustainable Hawaii, and we're talking about sustainable land transportation solutions on the island of Kauai and former mayor Joanne Yukimura, current council member and chair of the uh, Housing and Transportation Committee, has mm -hmm. been telling us about the Kauai Multimodal Land Transportation Plan. When we left off, we were talking about the health impacts of good transportation planning. Well, the multimodal plan, which I think is the only multimodal land transportation plan in the state, um, is a health plan because it shifts the mode from the single occupancy vehicle to what it, they call active transportation, which is biking, walking, and transit, because people have to walk to the transit stops and back from the transit stops. And so it pr produces healthier people. And as we saw in the indicators, if we can get that back on the screen, there's going to be, oh, I, the Think Tech Hawaii is kind of covering it up, but um, the last line there, the average annual household well, transportation Well, first, cost? just um, the percentage of adults meeting the minimum levels of physical activity is going to increase by 32%. Wow. And that's very significant. And then, as you pointed out, the, the other really great benefit of this plan and of this mode shift that we want to do is the average household transportation cost. You'll see that under the baseline scenario, it'll go up 15% if we continue just driving cars. And as we all know, the cost of oil and fuel gas will go up at some point. There's a projected 15% increase in average annual household transportation costs. Is, is that if the costs remain level at current cost of running an automobile? Um, I think it anticipates a little fuel cost mm -hmm. rip increase okay. but um, I, I'm sure it doesn't anticipate the really high possibilities but look at the look at the um, preferred scenario the last figure at the bottom is a six percent decrease in household transportation costs and I want to tell the story about my friend John who is a park ranger for the county he lives in Waimea commutes to work in Lihue every every week and he um, used to pay $350 a month gas money to do the commute by car. Now he rides the bus with an annual pass that costs $400, which is $33 a month. So he's actually saving about $3,000 a year. Another bus rider said, that's like a pay raise. You that's know. like a great vacation that he can take on that money. Act, yes, that's right. And that's the kind of savings this sustainable transportation system will bring to our people. Does that transportation plan also include um, allowance for more electric vehicle charging and other things? It, it does. But boy, 
I mean, I just went to one hotel on our island and, and the char I have an, a leaf, an electric car, and the chargers were all broken. Um, so, you know, that whole, and there's no charger, public charger on the west side, because there's no place with 200 cars, which I think is the requirement. No yeah. So, y you know, I'm watching very closely the implementation for electric cars, and I'm not sure that we can rely on that to solve our transportation problems. Plus, if it's still single occupant vehicles, we have parking problems, we have car costs, yeah. we still have the old system. Right, that's only An one unsustainable. slice. unsustainable, yeah. Yeah, only one slice of the answer, and plus that is very specific to a certain slice of the population that can afford those cars. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So public transportation is a broader solution and a more socially just solution. So the major problem with implementing this plan is we don't have any money. And it's going to take money to have buses coming more frequently, to put up erect shel bus shelters, to put Wi-Fi on the bus, which is one of our plans, um, to, to have some park and ride. Um, and, and so that is the major challenge for me and others who want to see this system become reality. What is Kauai. the estimated cost for full implementation of the plan? I don't know, because what we're doing right now is a um, short-term plan, a five-year plan, which is going to give us more money. But I can tell you, in 2011, when we went from, to, from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night and weekend service, which is every two hours, which is very difficult. It cost us a million dollars more in operating money. And, um, and that's why we need a, we don't, we can't do it on one shot grants or capital. We, so you didn't get enough revenue to cover that increased we did. operation we, cost? We did, and ah. the ridership skyrocketed. But now we have to go to the next level, which is probably every half hour on some of our really crowded routes. And, um, you know, oh, I, I had a $600,000 proposal in for this year's budget to make weekends every hour instead of every two hours. Mm -hmm. And from two instead of ending at 2 o'clock in the afternoons to end at 10 o'clock. And that cost 600000 So, y you know, more every year. Um, so you need the upfront cost, but you have faith that the revenue will cover those costs well, once I, you've lobbied for a half percent excise tax because it's a regular funding source just like the city has for their rail and to the legislature's credit they gave all the neighbor island counties a half percent the option of a half percent tax and i'm so sorry to report that none of the counties exercised that option um, which expired on july 1st a few days ago and why is that why did it expire? No, Be why did they did the opt out of it? Because they're saying nobody wants tax increases. And I heard the public differently. I heard the bus riders say, we will pay that ta tax. Uh, we actually downsize it to a quarter percent uh, per uh, quarter percent tax. So it would have been 25 cents on every hundred dollars purchased. And it was regressive. It would hurt the poor families. But if you use it for transit, those are the families who would get the benefit. So it's actually not regressive when you look at the full impact and, and life cycle cost well, of the excise tax. I, in the long run, as we make it more available for more families, um, it, you know, because right now just a small percentage of our families use it, but by making it more available, we will allow more of them to use it. So the regressivity, regressivity will get less and right, less. Right. Yeah. So in other words, those people who can't use it now because of the lack of uh, available timing, um, for example, those who might want to might work at a hotel and need to get on the bus late at night or early in the morning when it's not running, would then be allowed to use it. So therefore, the tax would be less regressive because they'd reap benefit once the service was put in place. Well, the thing to remember is tr transit, when well done, benefits everyone because it clears the road 
It um, helps our economy function better. It has health benefits. It has um, household income benefits. It has fatality, be you know, accident level. I mean, we saw those indicators. And there's multiple benefits that come not just to the riders, but to the society as a whole. That's why I think it's so justified to use the excise tax wisely for, for transit. So if that's not an option, at least for this year, uh, what are some of the options, other options for funding? Are there federal dollars available for this kind of cutting edge planning? No, the federal gov government, we just um, increased our road system from two lanes to four lanes between Lihui and the community college, which is two miles. And it did wonders for the traffic for two years, and now it's all starting to queue up again where the four lanes goes into two lanes. That cost for two miles to widen it cost $80 million. So when you compare the cost to of the taxpayer yes. of widening the roads for a very short-term benefit Correct. to the cost of perhaps a quarter uh, per $100, 25 cents per $100, in a rise in the excise tax, there's really a no-brainer argument for going with this kind of planning. But the federal funding still favors roads over transit, and so we could have used that $80 million to have that $1 million expansion for 80 years. I mean, so we, we have to begin to change our policies, I believe, but also at the local level, we have to use those monies well if they're made available. Um, so what do you want your audience, and particularly your constituents on Kauai, to do to try and help you support implementation of this plan? What is the next step to get it funded? I don't know right now because that um, excise tax, I went to get the excise tax power because there aren't that many other sources of funding for this transit system. And that's why I was so disappointed when on our island, we had a bill for it and it lost by one vote. Um, and, you know, I think we'll have to go back to the legislature, but it's hard to go back to them and say, give us the option again when we didn't even exercise it. So one thing people can do is they can go up to their their legislators and their council members and say, you know, we don't like taxes, but we want a better future for our island. We need a better transportation um, system, and we are willing to pay 25 cents for every $100 purchase to have a better system, because this is going to be better for us and our children. And our the generations before us made far bigger sacrifices for a good future. So please vote for a good future for us and fund this expansion because if we don't, the cost to quality of life, to our economy, to our families is going to be huge. Well, Joanne, thank you so much for coming and sharing this really important planning element for Kauai. And I hope our listeners will come back and join us next Tuesday at 12 o'clock for Sustainable Hawaii.